Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. In the previous lecture, we have seen how the X bar schema was successful in representing uh, lexical categories. And we have provided sufficient evidence to prove that in all lexical categories, namely noun phrases, adjective phrases, adverb phrases, verb phrases, all of them they allow the projection of an intermediate level category, which is added to the previously known phrase level category and word level categories. Today, we extend the analysis to the, uh, to the functional and inflectional categories. And we will see, we'll see I'm sorry, we will see that, that they also allow for the uh, representation of these categories following the requirements of the X-bar schema. So we will extend, we will start first by the prepositional phrases as a typical functional category. And what we say about prepositional uh, phrases also is valid for other functional categories and then we will further we will move to the inflectional categories so to begin with we, we will uh, consider a, a sentence in which the prepositional phrase has all the components of an x-bar schema what i mean is we will choose a, a prepositional phrase in which we have a specifier or determiner followed by a head and then an object, an object of the preposition, which is called here a complement. So in the sentence that you see in front of you, put it right on the top shelf. We have the head, of course, is the preposition on, and then it is preceded by the determiner right so on the top shelf is a preposition phrase in this case we say that it's an intermediate prepositional constituent because it consists only of the preposition and the complement without including the determiner right so of course the uh, representation following the x-bar schema will look like what you see in front of you, where you have a representation with P as a head, followed with a noun phrase, which is the complement, the top shelf, and then both of them, meaning the preposition and the NP complement, they project into a p-bar, an intermediate level category. And this intermediate category associated with the specifier right are going to project into a maximal projection, an xp, a pp. So most of the time, this is a remark, just for your knowledge, most of the time, the specifier of the preposition phrases is empty. What I mean is that PPs don't usually have specifiers. Therefore, it is needless to branch it if it is not concretely realized in the sentence or in the phrase. So as we did for the other uh, lexical categories, we are going to see what are the different kinds of uh, arguments which support the postulation of a P-bar constituent. One such argument can be based on pro-nominalization facts. Look at the example you have. The same example where we said, put it right on the top shelf. On the top shelf can be replaced by a proof form there as shown uh, in, 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 the, in the structure below. Put it right there. So the proof form there replaces on the top shelf, which means that this constituent 
is a p, a p bar and not a whole preposition phrase since the whole preposition phrase consists of the determinant right and what comes after it. Another argument can be based on coordination facts. So as you can see, if we coordinate, if we coordinate two preposition phrases, we get the structure uh, such as the one you see in front of you. The vase fell right off the table and onto the floor. So the two conjoined uh, constituents of the table and onto the floor are can be considered as p bar constituents since both of them they are determined by the specifier right so right off the table and right onto the floor but the parts which are coordinated are neither heads alone nor the whole preposition phrases with their specifiers what is coordinated in fact is just the preposition and its complement which uh, constitute the p bar constituent so the postulation of an intermediate p bar constituent larger than p but smaller than a pp has some empirical support now let us examine whether the x bar schema can be extended to uh, uh, to the sentence itself after we have seen that it, it, it is valid for representing lexical categories and functional categories now we'll see how it can be used to represent the whole sentence itself so look at the example you have in front of you the intelligent student might buy a new book the intelligent student might buy a new book in this sentence we have a subject and a predicate the subject of course is the intelligent student the predicate is might buy a new book but the predicate okay uh, if, if we analyze it we will see that it consists of might as a modal verb and buy a new book which is a vp so we have uh, the evidence okay uh, to uh, which we rely on to say that might is not part of the vp okay comes from uh, examples or from uh, for example uh, tests question tests in which might is moved to the beginning of the sentence and vp itself does not move uh, we can say might he buy a new book uh, so in this question form the model might is moved alone without what comes after it, which is a VP. Uh, we observed in all the previous categories that the head X, head is always an X, of a maximal projection XP consists of a single word, meaning that the head is always a single word. For example, the head of a subject in P is always a single N, and the head of uh, uh, VP is a simple verb. Accordingly, the head of the subject in P that we have in our sentence uh, is student, whereas the head of the VP by a new book is the verb by. So we have student is the head of the noun phrase subject, the intelligent, okay, the intelligent student, and the head of the VP is by. We are left with the uh, uh, might. So might, okay, should also head something. And up to now, we haven't associated it with a maximal projection. Therefore, we can say that we can consider that might is the head of the whole sentence. Before proceeding into this analysis, let's see what happens with other inflectional uh, uh, components, inflectional uh, elements, which behave in the same way as might. 
So consider these, these constructions. The intelligent student has bought a new book. The second sentence, the intelligent student buys a new book. As you can see, the difference between these two sentences is just simply that the first one is in, simp in present perfect and the second one is in simple present. If we apply a yes no question test to these examples, this is what we will get. In the first sentence, A, it will, it will become has the intelligent student bought a new book. As you can see, the constituent which is moved is just the auxiliary has. And then in the second sentence, the intelligent student buys a new book. If we want to ask a question, we, have, we, we should, record, should make use of the auxiliary uh, uh, do. And then what we get is uh, the sentence you have in front of you. Does the intelligent student buy a new book? So the auxiliary has is fronted in C. And the inflection as supported by the auxiliary verb do is fronted in D. Notice that fronting the inflection S by itself leads to ungrammaticality, which means we cannot ask a yes no question just by fronting the S of the of has or the S of the verb uh, buys, okay, in the, in the second sentence. So we cannot say S the intelligent student ha bought a new book. This is not this is nonsense. This is due to a morphological constraint. Inflection and morph, okay, morphemes or morphs are affixes which must be bound and can therefore not survive on their own, which means any uh, morphological bound morpheme needs to be associated to another support, another lexical element which supports it. Likewise, fronting the inflectional lexical verb buys in F is also illicit. It results in uh, ungrammaticality. We cannot say by the intelligent student a new book. This uh, this is due to uh, some peculiarities of the present day English. Though this uh, movement of the verb buys to the initial position of the sentence in yes no questions was allowed in old English or okay uh, now it's not allowed anymore. So without entering into more intricacies of this analysis, the inflection I is taken to be the head of the sentence IT. In sentences without models and auxiliaries, inflection is marked on the lexical verb. However, both pseudo-clefting and yes-no questions show that the inflection is not part of the VP, as we have seen with might and as we have seen with has or with asking question in sentences where you have just simple present. We need to uh, make use of the auxiliary do to support the S of the third person singular, which means that we do not move the whole verb, we just move the S supported by do. So the same holds for auxiliaries which can carry inflection, although models do not inflect, they behave like auxiliaries and are therefore treated in the same way, okay, they say an, uh, as elements inserted under I, head of IP. So in the X bar schema of, I, of, of, of an IP, we get the following representation. What is new here for you is that in the speak position of IP, we have the subject, he, or the intelligent student. I have to put he, okay, in this case, just for the sake of simplicity. Might is the head of the IP, and in followed by a VP, it is the, the complement of of might, we can say it's a complement of might because might selects a VP. Then we have v, it's the specifier, as we have seen before, of the VP is have, the head of the VP is both, and the complement of both is a new book. So starting from the bottom to the top, we say that both selects an NP as its uh, complement, and then and the both of them they project into a V bar. V bar with spec uh, of the VP have project both of them into a VP. The VP together with might, which is the head of the, in, in the whole sentence, the head of the IP, uh, project into an I bar, and then the I bar together with he, which is specifier, the subject, project into an inflectional 
phrase. So in this